Welcome to JSA TV, where we're covering the latest news, trends, and innovations from thought leaders from within the digital infrastructure space. Thought leaders like this guy to my right. This is Daniel Carney. Daniel is the Chief Technology Officer of Firmus Technologies. Daniel, welcome to JSA TV. Thank you so much, Dean. Great to be here. It is great to be it here. Is. I love, we are at DCD Connect, New York City, New York, the Big Apple, huge event. How's the event going for you? It's been fantastic. I think, you know, the energy on the floor, everybody realizes that they're, they're part of something pretty big right now. You know, data center infrastructure yes. has been the forgotten technology for a long time, but it's right at the very heart of AI. So it's a very exciting place to be. And you, you, you can't leave the JSA TV hot seat without talking about AI. Yeah. And you've just segued right <laughs> into the first question. So, so for our viewers that don't already know, maybe tell them a little bit about Firmus Technologies. Certainly. So Firmus Technologies is a pure AI factory builder. We're based out of Singapore, originated in Australia. Uh, we've developed the world's largest uh, immersion-based uh, GPU cluster in Singapore, which we are very proud for the DCD Asia Pacific Award last year. Congratulations. The whole premise of what we do is really optimizing flops per watt. So how do we drive the most amount of compute out of the least amount of energy? And I think it's something that has a very big sustainability impact, but more importantly, it's, it makes just sense for business. So yeah. that's our focus at Firmus, and we continue to explore all new technologies to drive what we can in, in AI and, and uh, develop it as best we can. So let's talk about some of those new technologies, specifically uh, liquid cooling. Um, right. I'm hearing a lot about liquid yeah. cooling, uh, Daniel, but uh, tell us um, what, what you all are doing uh, in that respect. So li liquid cooling is a response to the industry's increasing thermal design power, essentially. So we have models that are developing in the order of weeks. We have compute infrastructure that's changing the order of months. Mm -hmm. And we have this data center infrastructure that's on a time plan of about a couple of years. So yeah. liquid cooling is our response to the thermal design pressure that's coming from the chips, the density, the wattages are increasing. When we stood up our AI factory in Singapore, we were dealing with 700 watts hopper systems. Now the roadmap is, you know, 1200 watts and up to 1800 watts. I yeah, just this came, isn't going away. It's not going away. <laughs> and in fact, we were down in San Jose last week with GTC. Yeah. The, the 600 kilowatt racks are coming in 2027. So I, liquid I, cooling is the only show in town. I don't, I, it has to be. Yeah. It has to be. I mean, it, it's, it's you know, uh, of course, we at JSA, we love the sustainability angle there as well. But it is, it is imperative for, th for things to work. 100%. You yeah. know, it, yeah, I mean, the, we are rethinking and, and innovating how things get done, and cooling is a huge cog in making that happen. It is a huge cog. It's one of the key technologies that's enabling this density, this AI revolution. I mean, yeah. without the ability to manage the thermal density, we just can't build these systems. And these systems have to serve a purpose. They've got to be close to customers, low latency, high throughput, and very dense. Yeah. And liquid brings that when you think of total cooling you can bring that form factor to customers where it's needy. So, Daniel, do you have liquid cooling working right now? That's right. We have the world's largest immersion-based GPU cluster in Singapore. Immersion isn't the only technology right. we focus on, yeah. but it's given us the opportunity to remove chillers, to remove unnecessary air-moving equipment from our system. And ultimately, uh, you know, we've reduced the actual energy consumption in our system by 45% and operated partial PUE of 1.0. It works. It works and it makes a lot of economic sense. Yeah. Um, okay. Next question, maybe my favorite question: uh, the the die to data, the die to data center model. Tell us all about it. So the die to data center, silicon die to the data center model, is a, an engineering you know philosophy and, and thought process that we think about at Firmus. So when we're trying to develop what customers want, which is ultimately flops, computation output, mm -hmm. we're looking at every single touch point where energy is consumed in the system, literally from the silicon die through the network fabric, the data storage, the thermal management solution, mm -hmm. the power right through to the data center. I mean, ultimately the AI factory is a node on the grid. It has an impact on how the grid is being managed. Mm -hmm. And also internally, it's consuming energy at many touch points. So we use silicon die to data center as a way for us to think about optimization opportunities, you know, efficiency opportunities that will compound at scale. Yeah. So it's as much a way of building as it is the way we treat the problem as more of a system level problem rather than discrete technologies. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I mean, it, it, to me, like I, I hear sustainability play yeah. um, when, when we're talking about that. But uh, but, you know, obviously the efficiency, it, it also feels like it's the only way that we c you can do this uh, at, at scale and see the benefits at scale. It, it's got to be. I think the industry is realizing that, you know, we're having a significant impact on our on our electrical grid, our electrical consumption. Yeah. It's got to make business sense. There's a race to the bottom with compute infrastructure in terms of trying to drive down the token cost. Mm -hmm. And, you know, data center infrastructure is part of that conversation. So we need to be thinking at every moment, 
How do we optimize every technology choice we're using? How do we drive down the energy, the total cost of ownership? These AI factories are very complex systems, yeah. and we need to treat them like machines. You know, just like the miles per gallon in your automotive car, right? We, we know that the distance is the important part for you, and how much power do I need? It's flops per watt. Yeah. And we're, we're looking to optimize and drive efficiencies and be the world leader in, 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 uh, in developing AI factories that are the most sustainable. And, and what, I, what I like, or the, the message that, I, that I'm hearing that to me feels very unique, uh, is that this is a very AI-centric uh, um, process or, or, or um, mission yes. that you have. This is, this is about making this a reality in the most efficient way possible. That's what I'm really hearing from you. You're right. We, I mean, AI factories are distinctly different than data center constructs in a number of ways. And, and they, a lot of people don't understand that. They do. Yeah. I think there's, an, there's a kind of an appreciation that, you know, da data centers are just, you know, racks and stacks of storage and computer yes. network. But when you want to operate a reference architecture design from an NVIDIA, an AMD, or any other uh, silicon provider, you need to optimize everything because GPUs communicate with GPUs through the network. There's a minimum communication fabric that's required for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there's a minimum viable compute unit and that unit is no longer a, a compute tray or a rack. It's actually at scale of the order of 2,000 or 4,000 yeah. GPUs. It's at AI factory scale. That's why the system level uh, thinking has changed. It, it makes a lot, so it makes a, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, the one thing that maybe there's a, there's a bit of a, uh, an information gap, even, even for myself, and that is like the actual practical application of AI, can we talk about that for just a moment? Like, if I'm if I'm a if I'm a business and I'm thinking, I know that this is coming down. Mm. Uh, I know that it's going to have a significant impact on how I do business um, and my business perhaps viability. What do you tell a business like that? Um, what, what do they need to do now to prepare for that very, we'll call it near term reality? Yeah. You know, I used to work for Amazon Web Services prior, so I was very Heard much at the front of conversations yeah. when it comes to, um, you know, the aggregation of enterprise data, making use of your data. How do I use that to best effect in my business so that I always retain a competitive advantage? Artificial intelligence is an augmentation of what the data layer is. It's using your specific data to drive better products and services for your customers. Mm -hmm. And that's where this ret retrieval augmented generation capability, you know, getting in touch with your sovereign data and using that. And that has a national story as well. There's national yeah. you know, countries looking at that as yes. well. Um, so the AI, so com companies I think are in very different phases. Like they're still trying to figure out, first of all, getting their digital strategy in order. Then they're asked to implement uh, these models that are changing every couple of months. Yeah. However, those who succeed and figure out where they can apply um, amazing customer experiences, incredible automation, autonomous operations, taking humans out of the loop to put them in places where they add even more value, yeah. that's going to be where you start to drive better bottom line, better top line revenue generation and new products and services. And you know, all of that will be enabled by, yes, the models, also the company data, but also the ability to access effective, cost effect, cost effective um, and energy effective compute in, in regions where they need it. And we're seeing today, we had conversations earlier on about, you know, model training, moving to inference yeah. and inference having an edge as in a physical edge, you know, which is basically AI moving closer to customers yeah. with lower latency, yes. higher throughput. So we're going to see over the next couple of years, I think, a form factor change in the way AI is distributed. So we used to say cloud has an edge, yeah. you know, the cloud will precipitate down to the edge. We're going to see AI being built out of different form factors that puts very incredible compute at the edge in enterprise, probably in enterprise buildings potentially. Yes. At Firmus, we see form factors that are four times less. And we want to see how we can distribute the edge closer to customers <laughs> where it actually matters. I want to I want to talk to you for another hour about just that. Um, because um, and I and I know that we're probably over time, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna ask one more question. Because you because you mentioned it, like getting that that edge closer to that end user with regard to AI, to me that probably that that is the thing that actually does enable the research hospital to, 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 to see real miracles happen because of the uh, of AI input. I think this is, healthcare to me is one of the most exciting areas too. where the innovation is going to happen. Yeah. I mean, when we think about our own, you know, a blueprint or a digital blueprint of our own particular being and how you could use AI against yes. that to be. So one of the most exciting areas, I think, for AI, and, and like you said, a hospital that has the capability to return to a patient 
MRI imagery results or you know blood test results, ultrasound, and, fetal, I, instantaneous. So that's yes. an amazing patient experience. Yes. It, it obviously comes with a lot of emotional yeah. uh, capability, but that's the kind of capability that we're we're able to deal with and, and able to manage today. And the innovation is is there. There's a lot of questions obviously around governance, um, but the ability for the infrastructure to be part of a facility or a building with the compact form factor, yep. energy efficiency, uh, and to provide that is, is really where we're going to be. And it's going to be an exciting couple of months. It really is, and there's a sustainability play there, there too by, yes. by using the existing infrastructure, those existing facilities to facilitate the, the compute, right? I mean, That's right. it doesn't have to be a data center as we understand it today. No, it doesn't, but it does require an upskilling or a capability within companies to understand what are they tuning their company for. Yeah. If you're in the data center space, then if you're playing in AI, you need to understand that the metric is really the computation output, the ability for you to do it within a form factor and a power envelope that may be restricted. Yeah. Living in Singapore, yeah. very limited in power, limited in land, and very we don't want to use much water. Mm -hmm. Those are the three areas that we want to optimize for in our space. In other regions, there's there's not as much restrictions as on that, but we have geopolitical challenges with AI diffusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we're seeing countries trying to invent and be, be innovative around how they're using their GPU capacity today. Because if you're not using it and you're not securing sovereignty and your you know digital workforce build out capabilities, <laughs> yeah. That's going to leave countries in a challenging position in the future. So it's a, it's a very exciting space on a number of fronts. For for sure. Uh, let's do this again sometime. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I'd love to do. Daniel, thank you thank so much. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank and you. thank you, viewers, for watching JSA TV. We'll see you real soon.